Nkosi ya makusi Umdali wa Zonki si se si baba Uinkosi ya makusi Umdali wa lomshaba Sozi si zwe si dumisa wena Amen. When I thought about my cultural this morning, I thought to myself, sure, if I, if, if I did my cultural, two things would happen. The way, I'm the way I'm supposed to, two things will happen. Either we'll all run out of here, or, or it will get pretty interesting. <laughs> I'll leave that for you to, uh, to think through. Uh, we thank God for our cultures. We thank God for uh, everything that God uh, has intended. Isn't it so amazing that we could meet uh, from different places, different spheres, different makeups, and yet become who God wants us to become? I'm, I'm looking at how can I be an effective Christian, especially in this, uh, in this culture, in this time, with all these heritages and all these cultures that are embracing us all through. So I'm getting to think of this, I thought to myself, uh, choosing a title, the measure of an effective Christian would, uh, would be a good place to begin. Uh, the measure of an effective Christian. And I thought to myself, how can we be effective in the light of everything that we're going through? How can we be, uh, how can we stand up for our faith? Uh, how can we as though it were, look back on the cultures which we have come from and yet embrace what God has in store for us. And I thought to myself, this would be interesting, especially on a cultural day. Uh, I was, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing yesterday driving around and seeing how people are dressed and everybody's so proud of, uh, of their heritage and all that. And I thought to myself, what about us Christians as children of God? Uh, could it be that God has called us out of a mix so that we can become who he wants us to become. Amen. It used to be so, it's so easy if it's one culture, it's so easy if it's the same kind of people, then you can just uh, talk to anybody that you'd wish to. But then the fact that we are so different and so diverse, that poses kind of a challenge to say, uh, how do we become effective in our faith on the basis of the fact that there's so much diversity that is around us. Amen. Amen. And this, uh, uh, and this knocks at our doors, each and every one of us. Because each and every one of us has, is an extension of who God wants us to be. Like we always say, you didn't arrive here on earth and then God says, let's figure out what we're going to do with this guy. No, no, no. God planned you. And God placed you so that he can execute in and through you his purpose for this earth. We always sing and say, but this earth belongs to the Lord. And the fullness thereof, even you, even me, even our cultures, our diversity, but all come together to complement what God is doing and God has in store. Can somebody say amen? So our Christian heritage defines our culture and shares values, laws and, and uh, institutions uh, which, have inherit, which have inherent, uh, which we have pretty much inherited, sorry, from our patriarchs. When we, we understand who we are today because of what our patriarchs have gone through and the example that they have put in front of us. We look at Abraham and we say, but today we can have the audacity of faith because Abraham painted a good picture about faith and believing in God, even though his ancestors worshipped idols. Jacob, Isaac, and all the generations, Joseph, all this paint a picture of a faith in God that looks back at the past and says, I, have, I can be redefined in the basis of the fact that I have connected with God and God has a purpose and a plan for my life. Can somebody say amen? amen. So 
it is not wrong to have our culture and our and and our our, our embedded way of thought but then it comes to bow down to what god has instituted for us in the first place if abraham could leave the chaldeans so can i leave what i perceive is my culture to become part of what god has in store amen if isaac if uh, Jacob, if Joseph could even be, uh, could even be uh, sold into Egypt, into a foreign land, into a place and a culture and a setup that he was never used to, so can we as well look back and say, but God is more interested in our future, though our past comes into play. I'd rather connect with us that have a shared future and of shared destiny than connect with you and me based on my past, based on what I perceived that I was. I'd better look at what God is doing in the, in the future than hold on to what is past because somebody said there is no future in the past. Can somebody say amen? amen? But there is a destiny ahead of you, each and every one of us. There is a purpose that God has called us and committed us to. Important as our past helped to define us, it's also important that the destiny that God has in store for us will be embraced and, and will fulfill it in the name of Jesus. Somebody say amen. So when you look at their, our patriarchs, when you look at their godly influence uh, that has shaped and informed our nature, affecting our identity, it informs who we are. What Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, what they went through, the, uh, the example and the patterns that they laid down, it makes up our identity today. And we're just going to share briefly, and I know our time is not really good, but I'm going to rush through this, and I know that the Lord is going to help us. Amen. Thank you so much. We appreciate. Now, as so today we engage on how to be effective in our Christian walk, that is on our heritage, because I come to see that our Christian walk becomes our heritage that we have to start living on so that we can have a spiritual heritage for our kids and our grandkids that are to come. So that they will look back and say, like the grandkids of Abraham and said, there was our grandfather that lived and believed God and God multiplied him and moved with God. And that gives us the confidence to say, even as Abraham moved with God, I can also move with God. Amen. The, uh, the testimony of Terence and Kami, I mean, it's, it's so wonderful how they can walk in the favor and the mercies of God. I promise you, it's not their culture that, uh, that delivered that to them. It is our walk with God that delivered that to them. Amen. It is a faith based upon the finished work of Jesus Christ. The favor that God attaches upon each and every child of his. Can somebody say amen? It's okay. Just say, I'm next in line. The Lord has not forgotten my address. Come on, you can say that to yourself. Amen. Sometimes we, uh, we, it, it becomes difficult, especially as, uh, as these new age Christians, to say, oh, it's okay when God is doing something for me. But the moment he starts doing something, something for somebody else, we start looking and say, mm, who is he? Isn't that, isn't that pretty much Christian? Ne? But I want us, I want us to, uh, to debate differently today, to say, but I can celebrate your victory because the same father that we have is the same father that you have. I can celebrate you when things are going right. I can pray and engage with you even when things are not working out because we have a heritage from our father God that connects us and desires the best for our lives. Tell your neighbor God desires the best for you, even if you don't know it. Sometimes you have, to be, you have to be told so that you can know that God desires the best for you. Amen. So we've got all this, uh, our heritage that we walk in, our Christian heritage that has been founded upon our patriarchs. And God has sovereignly placed us where he desires us so that we can become an influence. Somebody say influence. You can be influencing people and influencing attitudes and we can influence values. God did not place you here on earth so that you can just exist. 
God placed us here so that we can influence cultures, we can influence attitudes and values and, and outcomes, and we can facilitate transformation in the lives of God's people and in the life of the, uh, of the world in, uh, in, uh, at large. Amen. I see they've run ahead of me. That's good. Now, let's turn to the book of 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. I want us to engage the scriptures a little bit this morning so that we can find the basis of our walk with Christ. We can try to discuss the issue of how can we be effective as Christians on this changing world? How can we become effective as the children of God on this earth, in this world that is changing, in this world that is trying to influence us? How can we become effective in influencing it? Come on, that's good. I got a good amen there. Amen. Come on, somebody else say amen. That's good. How can I influence and impact and not necessarily be influenced or be impacted with a changing world that has no basis, has no morals, the culture therein is not godly, cannot transform and cannot deliver destiny? How can I change? How can I become effective? How can I fulfill my purpose and the mandate of God upon my life in a world that seeks to challenge me when I say, but God said, they said to me, did you see him? When I say, but God is moving, they say, can you see it? When you say God, they look at you and say, ah, you're religious. No, I'm not religious. I am divinely by nature and I respond accordingly. Okay, now let's go. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 1. If you bear me with me, I'll run through this. Simon comes and engages his audience and says, Simon Peter, a born, a, a born servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith, and I need you to stick here with me on this scripture, like precious faith with us by the righteousness of God, and Savior Jesus Christ. In other words, uh, Paul engages his audience to tell them, look here, you are who you are because you have been given a faith. You have a faith that the basis of that faith is the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. It's not because our, 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 our attitude has been informed. It's got nothing to do with uh, we have, uh, we, 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 we have, uh, we have, modified behavior modified behavior can be remodified back again but our faith in the fact that the righteous God has set aside for us it is the basis of our identity even this morning now this speaks of our identity and consequently the foundational heritage of our faith that's why he said that's why uh, Peter said that we obtain like precious faith with us by the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The fact that God is a righteous God and he's got right standing, that is what qualifies you to have the faith that you have. You did not join a clique. You did not just become part of a movement. You, are, you opened up for God's righteousness, God's right way of standing, be impact and influence and change your identity and give you a new heritage in life. That's what Peter was telling him. He was saying, no, 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 no. I know you are a Jew. I know you are a Greek. I know you are this. I know you are that. Important as that is. There is a basis that we stand together, which is based upon the finished work of Jesus Christ, his righteousness, his way of standing that qualifies you to stand before God justified. That's what Peter was telling. It's got nothing to do with what you do. It's got nothing to do with uh, who you know. It's got nothing to, it's got everything to do with the finished work of Jesus. That righteousness that Christ has is what qualifies you this morning. That's why our faith is not based upon our works. It's upon the faith of God, the, the, the finished work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. Now, verse 2. Just go to the next slide, please. Verse 2. It says here, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. Says, grace and peace to what? Be multiplied to you based on the fact that your identity is connected 
to the righteousness of God. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. In the knowledge of our Lord. Number three, he says, and has his divine power has given us all things but pertaining to life and godless all. Now, here is Jesus. You are connected to him. Your identity is found in him. And based upon that, this is what he says, that he's got divine power. He has it. Let's, let's imagine he's standing right here. You are connected to him. Your identity is affiliated to him. In spite of how you came on this earth, by faith, by his righteousness, his right standing, you are connected to him. And that him is the divine power. Let's see what he does here with it. That he has, in, if you are in him, his divine power flows to you so that it can give you everything that you need in life and with regards to all this. So, you are not just of your own. You just didn't join a clique and a club. You just didn't affiliate to your church, to a church. You are connected to Christ. You are in Him. And because you are in Him, inside Him, His power is all over you to give you a divine to give you a divine entrance into your identity and to uh, and favor and multiply and give you everything that you need for life and for godliness. Come on, lift up your hand and say, I am glad that I'm in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. And he has given us everything that pertains to life and to godliness, which means that you can live life and live it abundantly. Why? Because you are in Christ his power is in you. And his power has given you the power to have life abundantly and connect you to everything that you need in this life. Hey, what? And through knowing him, imagine Jesus is here. Through knowing him, this is what Peter says. That he has called us to glory. In other words, he has taken you from the whichever shambles that you found yourself in. And he has called you and presented you and glorified you with virtue, with a moral power, and with everything that it takes to make it in this life. That's what he has done. Now, number four, he says, by which we have been given exceedingly great and precious promises. And through this, that you may be, ah, this is a good one, if you're underlining, underline this one. That you may be what? Partakers of the divine nature. Come on, let's track it back again. This faith that you have, this new identity that you found in Christ, it's not because you joined a club or a, or a church or whatever it is. It's that you are born again, that you are connected with Christ, that his power now resides in you. He gives you everything pertaining to life and to godliness. And that knowing him, every promise that he has given you will stand as sure to be fulfilled in your life. And this is why, this is why. Remember you are inside, you are in him, ne? You are in, I said, nah. You are in him. And his power works and functions in you, in your life. It has given you. Now, here's the thing. We just don't come and shandai, shandai because it's fashionable. No, 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 no. We tap into his power that he has already availed to us. We just don't speak in tongues because it's fashionable. We connect and we lock in the spirit because we tap into his power. The grace that provides his power to give us a life Everything pertaining to life and pertains to godliness. Now, we are in him. And the fact that we are in him, we have found ourselves that whatever it is in him, it is in us. Hi, let me qualify it on this way. Whatever is in Christ, his power, his divine ability, the life and life abundantly that he has promised you, that everything that is in him, it's also in you. And that's why Paul says here that he has, he has made us to become divine partakers. To participate in his divinity. It means that there is no demon in hell that has authority over your life. 
It means that there's no challenge on this earth that you cannot stand based on the based on the fact that you have a divine nature in you and that you cannot speak into it any situation. Sir, isn't it amazing that Jesus said you can look at that mountain and command it to be removed and it will be removed. What natural man would speak to a storm and it would cool down? What natural man would speak to a mountain and that, that mountain would disappear? It's only the fact that you are in Christ. His nature is in you. His power is in you. And that you are now being qualified to have a divine nature in you. I'm painting a picture, good people, that our culture and our heritage in God is bigger and stronger than any culture and heritage that we found here on earth. In Christ, you've got power. In Christ, you've got ability. In Christ, you've got authority. In Christ, you are elevated. In Christ, you are an overcomer. And your culture has nothing to do with it. My background has nothing to do with it. I have been qualified by the fact that Jesus paid the price for me. I am in Christ. His nature has infused inside me. That's a good English word right there. Infused. But even when I speak, and when I say I, I mean you as well. Every situation has to take cognizance of the fact that there is a child of God that carries divine nature that has opened its mouth to declare what God is saying. Whew. Your challenges have no, they have, no, uh, they have no excuse but to listen to you. Your problems have no excuse than to listen to you. Let me tell you this. Heavens has no excuse but to listen to your prayer when you're praying to God the Father. Because divinity connects with divinity. The natural man does not understand the things of the spirit because they are spiritually discerned. That's what Paul said. Now you have to have the nature of God so that his divinity can rub in you so that you can look at things in an extraordinary way. The ordinary does not understand the things of the spirit because they are spiritually designed. You have to understand that the nature of God is in you to connect with God. So that when you stand and even say our father, you're talking about a spiritual language there. Amen. Now let's run quickly here. Now, number five. The next slide please. This is what he says. Verse five. Peter says, but also for this very reason. In other words, after telling you that you are divinely, after telling you that you are connected to God, after telling you that his power is resident inside your life, he comes back and says, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Let me, pay, let me show you this thing. He says, but also for this very reason. He says, over and above all that, he says, give all diligence. Add to your faith virtue. Hey. And to virtue, knowledge. Verse 6. And to knowledge, hey, a good one that we struggle with as Christians. Self-control. You can be divinely and in Christ, but your body wants to act up and tell you what to do. I'm getting little amens, Pastor. You can be divinely, shining all you can, but your body and your mindset wants to dictate to you how to behave differently from the nature that God has desired for you. That's why he says, over and above everything, you're in Christ, you've got power, shandai, shandai, a tie by bow tie and all that. He comes and says, but to all that, he says, give diligence. To your faith that you have, shandai, Add virtue, moral power. He says, and to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, self-control. And to self-control, perseverance. Hey, when you're talking about perseverance to, to Christians nowadays, it's, it's like a swear word. A pastor has been waiting for one week. My answer has not come. Joseph waited for 13 years 
after the promise was given. You know, Joseph impressed me. This boy was loved by his father. Even his father made a beautiful coat for him, like some have seen here. I almost thought your father was Jacob. And his brothers were so envious, including his own brother, Benjamin, that they decided to sell him to Egypt. Before they sold him, they dug a pit. They had enough time to dig a hole, to deepen inside. And then they realized, no, 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 let's slaughter a goat. Let's go lie to our father that this boy has been killed by a wild animal. And then let's, let's sell him to Egypt. Now, here's the thing. When the brothers went home with the money that they got from, the, uh, from selling their brother, I'm very sure their wives were celebrating, oh, the Lord has provided, because they didn't know the truth of the matter. When they saw provision, they say, it is the Lord that has provided. Maybe it was. I'm not saying it was. But here's the thing. He persevered. He knew the dream of his brothers bowing to him. It was only executed 13 to 15 years later because the man was persistent. Throw me in the desert. Throw me in the wilderness. Throw me in the prison. Throw me in the pit. I know that the word of the Lord will come to pass. Perseverance. The question I have today is, do we have the faith to persevere? Even when the answers to our, to our, to the answers to, to our questions and the answers to our prayers, they're still on the way. They are delaying. Persevere. Throw whatever you want to throw at me. I know I am in Christ. His nature is in me. I am powerful. God has authenticated me. And because of that, I know my answer is still on the way. I might not see it right now. Perseverance. Some of us, one, somebody says one or, one or little something about us, that's it. We blow our tops. We can't persevere enough. When pastor says, hang in there, push, keep on pushing, we cannot push enough. Why? Because we are microwave generation. We want to see our results here and now. It's like this guy who prayed and said, God, give me patience, give me now. Patience now. That's who we become. We can persevere. And then he says here, perseverance, as you persevere, put godliness in it. Understand who you're connected to and what God is expecting of you. Now, I'm just telling you a few measures to be an effective Christian. As much as you're powerful, as much as God moves with you, but you also need this to be effective as a Christian in your life. So that your family can look at you and say, whoa, but there's a man of God here. Even if, even if you're the least in the family, God can look and say, but this one is something else. Now he says, and to godliness, yo, a good one here. Brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. <laughs> For if, take note of number eight. For if these things are yours and are bound, you will neither be barren, nor of unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You can be powerful, identified with Christ, yet you can be barren with regards to the knowledge and the destiny that God has for you. It is possible. You want to be fruitful in your life, fruitful in the walk with God. Understand your identity, who you are in God. Understand what has been endured on you. And then again, understand that you got to give diligence to your faith, to virtue, to knowledge, to self-control, to perseverance, to godliness, to brotherly kindness, to love, loving as God would want us to love. It says, if you consider these things, if you consider these things, you will not be unfruitful in your life. The question I have is, let's measure our Christianity this morning. How fruitful are we with the matters of God. Just a question. Number 10, he says, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. Underline that, put stars, hashtag, do whatever you want to do. Jump on it. You will not, you will never stumble if you consider these facts. You will never stumble. In other words, it is possible to stumble privileged as you are. It is possible to stumble. It says, for, for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, I want to share you quickly in the next few minutes that I have left. 
the gist of what I wanted to say this morning. I want us to look at key elements that measure effectiveness and fruitfulness in Christianity. Now, number one. Let's run to the next slide. Number one. Loving service. In the book of Colossians, it says that effective Christians participate in loving service towards others. Now, in the book of Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, let's, let's turn there quickly, the next slide. It says, and whatever you do, do it heartily. I like what the, the passion translation, I, I couldn't get it on the screen. It says, do it with all your heart. Do it with a motivation, with a passion. Because you know that you're doing it unto the Lord, not just unto mere people. In other words, when you're serving your generation, when you're serving your people, when you're serving where God has placed you to serve, you serve it and you know that you're doing it unto the Lord, not just unto people. We don't serve so that we can get an applause. Let me say it on this side. We don't serve so that we can get an applause. An applause may come. An applause may not come. We are not in here for the applause. The center stage is given to one and only the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who is Jesus Christ. That is the applause that we are looking for. So we love and serve others because the applause is not going to come from people. Leadership, we might, we might overlook you by mistake or by chance. But it doesn't mean that now your privilege in Christ has been withdrawn. It means that you are looking for a higher applause which the owner and the author is God himself. So that's why Paul in Colossians says, do everything you do as unto the Lord. Goodness me, let me trade dangerously here. As we serve in the corridors of service, as we bless the Lord in front, as we work behind the curtains, as we flip those burgers and we flip those burros roll, whatever it is that we do, we do it as unto the Lord. Picture and imagine the Lord is standing right here. And watching you and everything you do, he has to stand and say, well done, well done, well done. Sometimes it, sh it shocks me that I do what I do and then the Lord would look and say, what on earth was, what are you doing? Yo, that scares me good. At the heart of servanthood is our willingness to go out of our way to meet a need in someone's life and to accomplish something that needs to be done. Because we're doing it as unto the Lord, not as unto people. Yet here is a paradox of it, sir. We do it as unto the Lord, but we have to do it to people. And God says when you do it to people, you do it unto me. Remember that scripture Jesus said, that parable. He says, uh, the man was walking and, and, and he fell among thieves. And then a Pharisee came and, and saw the guy left him there. A, 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 a Levite did the same. The person that responded was a Samaritan. Do you remember that? So from our Sunday school, nah, you remember that? Then the Samaritan took him and went and paid his debt and did everything that he did. And then Jesus asked, but who was a neighbor to this guy? Hey, sometimes you have to understand that your service is an answer to prayer for somebody else. You have to understand that your service, that's why you can't take for granted the way you serve, the way we love people. It doesn't matter. Indiscriminatory. It, does, it, it, it comes because the one that gives the applause is not the person that likes you. It's God on high that applauds you. Somebody say amen. So next time, when you're busy at your work in your office, even then, whatever you do, you do it with a loving caring service. Why? Because you know that you're not doing it just for the boss. You're doing it for the Lord. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. That will inform the way we work. <laughs> that will inform the way we work. It will inform the way you work at, uh, at your work. If you're used to just doing things because this boss doesn't appreciate me, I feel unappreciated, I feel unengaged, I, uh, they gave this thing to another person, should I get? No, no, no. If the Lord is looking at you, are you doing it as unto the Lord? Or are you doing it as unto your boss? 
Selah. The second thing, quickly. Let's look at the second thing. Just one more point and then we're done. I see the kids are giving you a clue they're in. Second thing, effective Christians serve by displaying a commitment to evangelism. Evangelism basically is a reaching out to another person, letting, allowing the work of the Lord to continue through you. Now, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, that's a scripture. It says, for we are God's workmanship. Gentlemen, number two, the second, the second scriptures, Ephesians chapter 2. It says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do what? To do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. There is a work that God has prepared for you to do. There is a work. There is a way. Do you remember that, that song? Do you remember that song? Uh, I think my, uh, the, the Soweto congregation will remember. There is a race that I must to be won. Give me power every hour. As much as there is a race, there is also a commitment, a work that God has ordained for each and every one of us here. Ephesians 2.10 It is really easy to become sidetracked from our main mission. Someone said, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Hi man, that sounds nice. I'm feeling like saying it again. Can I say it again? Do I have your permission to say it again? The main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. Or should I say like uh, African-Americans, the main thing. Just pull that one in there, the main thing. One time my daughter came from school and says, Daddy, your Mercedes is not parked in the right place. I said, I know it is as a Mercedes. You're telling Mercedes. And ever since I've been calling it Mercedes, I'm like, wow, okay. So the main thing. Let's keep the main thing, the main thing. It is easy to be distracted. That's what I'm trying to say here. Pointing people to Christ. This unfelt and selfish service seeks to create opportunities for someone to be reached by God's saving grace. The Christian message never changes. But its context does in the way it's presented. And that's evangelism. Some of you can reach people that pastor cannot reach. Some of you can go to places. Right now, Brother Terence is in Saudi Arabia. If, I, if pastor ever showed up there to stand in the street and say, come to Jesus, maybe it would be the last that we saw him. But then God avails opportunities whereby through his own divine working, the gospel is going to be presented there. And people are going to be changed. Look at how God may create opportunities. He might not grab a mic in public places. But the influence that he has will communicate a good example of Christ. Put yourself in there in the areas of your influence. That's evangelism right there. We cannot, we cannot separate our Christian engagement to the lost. Or to the ones that are without Christ from our identity. We cannot separate that. It's intertwined. God calls you so that he can with you accomplish and do what he has to do. That's how it works. Now, let's go to number three quickly. The third one. I'm going to close up with this one. Effective Christians serve by promoting discipleship. I've got two scriptures for you here. Gentlemen, let's move on. Effective Christians serve by promoting discipleship. The book of John chapter 8 verse 31, it says, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, and my, then you are my disciples. Indeed, there is an abiding in God's word to be done for discipleship, to, for you to quantify as a follower of Jesus. Because when you abide in the word, you give the word an opportunity to influence and impact you. Amen. Again, the next scripture, this is what he says. John chapter 15 verse 8, he says, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. 
so that so you may be my so you will be my disciples. I'll read that again. John chapter 15, verse 8. By this my father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. In other words, all the privilege, remember where we started? God calling you out, placing you in Christ. Put it, giving you power, enduring with his might and his strength and giving you a divine nature so that you can be able now to express yourself on a divinely notion. So that when you engage with virtue, with knowledge, with power, you can come to a place of becoming fruitful in your life. It's all about drawing you to what Christ has drawn up for you. It's all about that. Discipleship is about training and equipping ordinary Christians, ordinary everyday Christians to be active in serving and spreading their faith. Our willingness to serve, to serve others and to share our faith and grow as a Christian is an indicator of the depth of our relationship with Christ. Not just by what we say, but also people will be impacted 90% by what they see us do. Amen. Come on, let's all stand on our feet. Let's stand on our feet this morning. Just want to make a declaration or two, and then we're going to bring it to a close. Hallelujah. 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 Have you been blessed this morning? Are you learning something this morning? Amen and amen. Now, under the Mosaic law, a Hebrew servant became a free man during the seventh year of his service. However, if the servant loved his master and wished to remain his servant, then he would be taken to the doorpost. And his ear would be pierced with an awl, with the thing that pierced leather. This piercing would signify that he was now his master's servant for life. The question I have for you is, are you willing to be your master's servant for life. I think the ladies have beat us to this. They've already pierced their ears. Gentlemen, shall we take you outside here? If you say, I am, I, the Lord is my master. The Lord is my master. The Lord is my master. Just remember. Sounds funny, but are you effective as a Christian in your life? In the community where God has placed you? Amidst the cultures and the diversities and the challenges that you face, are you radiating the glory of the Lord? Jesus said, are you a salt? You are the salt of this earth and the light. A light cannot be hidden under the table. Your light has to be put on a table so that darkness can flee. You are a darkness remover. I tell your neighbor this. You are a darkness remover. <laughs> you are a salty tasty <laughs> and I'm, I'm, not to, I'm not being funny here man. come on, when I say to a salty tasty it could translate into something else I don't want to go into that right now until you get to a couple's meeting but you are to, salt, salty tasty you spice up life by your presence and your ambience life becomes spicy because that is what God has entrusted in your life you are effective you are powerful you are divine. The nature of God is in you. Things cannot remain the same when you walk in. There will be lying and swearing and throwing tantrums when you are lying there like, oh, she's here. It's okay. That's what you've been called for. Being the difference maker. Change maker. You shine light and demons have to take cognizance of your presence and say, but there's a difference maker among us. Let's stop lift up our hands and say, God, I want to be effective in your kingdom. Make me effective in your kingdom. Help me. Strengthen me. Enjoy me with your grace and your power. As you've already declared, I stand today to affirm what you've already done in my life. I am not a weak nobody. I am not a nothing. I am empowered by the power of God. My identity is found in Christ and the finished work at Calvary. Lord, 
Thank you for your children. Father, they stand as we stand together upon these basics, upon these facts of your word that, Father, will in fact change. We will put change where we go. Father, everything we do, every place, every person that we speak to, Father, there will be a change. There will be a notable difference in the lives of people because your children have stood in their place as be effective and powerful as you have called them to be. Thank you, Father, that we are difference makers. We are change effectors. We are light. We are darkness expellers. Father, we shine bright like a star in every situation in our lives. Father, strengthen your children to become even better witnesses. Blessed be your name. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Somebody say amen.